Cross of Peace, thank you for joining us in this lovely day of worship. We're here to minister to you because we know that whatever's going on in the world, God is still here, so we are still here. So we are still here to talk to the people, sing to the people, and lift you up in spirit. I'm about to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning, God. We come to you with an open heart, Father God, an open mind, Father God, and an open yes, spirit. God. We say continue to pour into us. Continue to use us, continue to utilize us, and continue to allow us to have wisdom in how we operate today to day. Allow us to continue to love on our neighbors, Father God, and be there for others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. amen. Why do you cry? Oh, I've heard a 
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I never alone. You're a good, good father to you all. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far. Those that are sick on our job and our communities, in our school, God, 
in this world, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you would give the scientists, God, the knowledge and wisdom to create this vaccine for this coronavirus, God. I pray not only for that, that you just command people's immune system to be strong and fight and re expel out these invading viruses and bacteria, oh God. In the name of Jesus, for those that are suffering, God, from cancer and from diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and multiple sclerosis and lupus and Lyme disease and Crohn's disease, oh God. You are the great God, Jehovah Rapha, God, the Lord that healeth thee, God. And I just pray, oh God, that those people will begin to seek your face. Even this pandemic, God, will draw people close to you to seek the Lord while he may be found and to call upon him while he is near, God. Let people see we are fragile, God, and we can't survive this life on this planet without you, oh God. And we need you of every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day. For you are the vine and we are the branches, oh God. And if we will remain in you and you and us, we will bear much fruit, oh God. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. Have your way in those people who are sick, God. Raise them up and turn around that a testimony may break forth of how they was healed by the great God Almighty. And your name will be exalted throughout the earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, asking that you would cast out the fear, God, that would try to come upon people's hearts, oh God. Because you don't want us to fear, oh God. You want us to look and trust in you, God. I'm reminded of your word, God, in Isaiah 43 and 1. You told us to do not fear. For I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, and you are mine. And because we are yours, oh God, we look to you, oh God. We ask that you would give us strength, God, that you would give us peace, God, in the midst of these troubling times, God. We thank you that your word tells us these things will come, God, but we should not succumb to them, oh God, but that we should look to you all the more, God. You told us to encourage each other all the more as we see the day approaching, oh God. So we ask right now that you will, oh God, strengthen our faith, God. Encourage our faith. May our feet be planted in you, oh God. May we not look to the left or to the right, God. But where our eyes are upon you, oh God. Because you are the great, the mighty, living God, the true God. And Lord God, we should not fear God. You're giving us power, love, and of a sound mind, God. So we seek your face today, God, asking that you remove upon those that might be in their homes today, those that might be on their jobs today, wondering what's going to happen, God. But we curse this virus, God. We pray that it will dry up, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray, God. And we ask that we will walk in your name, oh God, that people will see, God, the goodness of the Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Father, we pray that if there's anything, Lord God, that should not be, oh God, that it will come to light and we call it null void in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for all of our leaders, our pastors and the teachers, Lord God, that are teaching your word that have had to make difficult decisions to close, Lord God, the churches today, oh God. Lord God, we pray, God, that people will still lift you up and know that you are God and to seek your face. Father, we pray, oh God, oh God. in every situation, oh God, yes. that your name, oh God, will be lifted up. Father, we thank you, God, that we are your people who are called by your name, are turning from our wicked ways, seeking your face, oh God, that you will forgive us of our sins, God that you will hear from heaven and that you will heal the land, God, according to your word. Father, we bless you. And I hear the word of the Lord saying in my ear this morning that if my people will be as passionate for me as we have been in going to buy materials, if we will be as passionate in seeking, hallelujah, my face, as we have been in being panicked, then the peace, my peace, that surpasses all understanding will keep you in perfect peace. An urgent call to prayer by way of conference call. You are invited to join our church family in prayer this Tuesday from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Prayer will cover the COVID-19 pandemic and other areas of concern. You will be given a telephone number to dial 
and a code to enter to connect to the phone conference line. Uh, for more information, email us at the, T-H-E, house, H-O-U-S-E, of, O-F, peace, P-E-A-C-E, the number four, the letter U, at gmail.com. One more time, the house of peace, the number four, the letter U, at gmail.com. God bless. Please tune in to our 15-minute online Food for Thought Bible study every Wednesday from 7 to 7.15. We will be glad to have you. God bless. I want to thank you for taking time to watch our online service today. And I want to thank all of those, especially from the House of Peace, during this difficult time of not being able to have church and have to do online church those of you who have stepped up to the plate and uh, you have given your regular tithes and offerings and it has helped us. And I want to say to those that are part of our family, please, uh, my pastor used to say uh, a man will follow his money. And, and then Jesus said that where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. And so we need you, church family. And we need others that are watching this service to please help us to meet our budget. You know, just like your home, your bills are not going to go away. And the bills here at the church are going to continue to have to be paid. But like I said, I really do want to thank all of those that have, uh, have helped us to meet the budget. And we need to continue to meet the budget. And so uh, there are several ways that you can give and uh, that and you will see that up on the screen. First of all, uh, you can write a check or cash and you can bring it by the church uh, Monday through Thursday from 11 uh, to four o'clock. And uh, you can you can do it that way or you can write a check or a money order and you can mail it to uh, the House of Peace. Um, the address is uh, P.O. Box 52393 Once again, P.O. Box 52393 Jacksonville, Florida 32201 and then uh, if you want to do it online, the simple thing is, is to do is if you have Cash App, you can go to Cash App and uh, type the dollar sign House of Peace Jacks or the dollar sign uh, House of Peace for you. OK, and then or you can just simply go to PayPal and uh, go to the House of Peace for you the house of peace for you.org and you can give through PayPal uh, through our online uh, website. So thank you once again. We appreciate you. May blessings be upon you and may God continue to meet your need because he says that if we give, it shall be given to us of good measures, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto our roof. God bless you. I want to thank you for taking time to be with us this Resurrection Sunday online service. And I'm so excited about presenting the word of God to you today. I know that God has something special for everyone that is listening right now. And even those that will be listening later on in the day or this week or next week or next month or so on. This past week, God has taken me out of my comfort level. <laughs> I mean, he really has taken me out of my com comfort level when it comes to how he wants me to present this anointed message to you today. I want to entitle this anointed message, Introducing the Greatest Person Who Ever Lived. Let me say that again. Introducing the Greatest Person Who Ever Lived. From the history of human civilization, all societies have one thing in common. They thrive on recognition. 
especially when it comes to recognizing influential people, whether they were greatly admired, hated, or put fear in us, and even those who we might consider to be our heroes. Now, this is especially true in our great country called the United States of America. We, as Americans, we like icons. What is an icon? Someone who is considered very influential, recognizable, revered, or idolized. Now, let me give you some examples of, of what I mean by this. When I mention the name Abraham Lincoln, what is he best known for? He's best known for as the 16th president of the United States, and he led this country during the American Civil War, and then he's most famous for the Emancipation Proclamation that pushed for the freedom of all slaves throughout the nation. Let me give you somebody else. When I say the Beatles, what are the Beatles famous for? They were an English rock band that became arguably the most successful act of the 21st century. And then, let me give you another person. What about Martin Luther King Jr.? What is he best known for? He was an American civil rights leader in the 1960s, and, is most famous, and he's most famous for his 1963 speech, I Have a Dream in which he spoke of his dream of the United States that is void of segregation and racism. And then, uh, I know you will know this person. What is John Lucas best known for? He's best known for writing and directing Star Wars and creating the Indiana Jones series. Okay, let me give you a sports figure. What is Michael Jordan best known for? He is widely considered to be the greatest basketball player in the history of the game. You see, a vast majority, a vast majority of you, you could identify with these human icons when I mention their names. But not only that, but I would like to highlight people who have done some extraordinary things. Let me give you some modern-day examples of what I'm talking about. For example, ABC World News Tonight, it does the person of the week. It provides a short bio biography or story of an interesting person. At the end of that Friday night broadcast, it often features Americans, either famous or obscured, who have inspiring stories involving selflessness, but is not strictly limited in its focus. Or think about it. What about Time Magazine's Person of the Year? It features the profile of a person, a group, an idea, or an object that, for better or worse, has done the most, it has influenced us the most throughout the events of the year. And then you have the most influential person of the decade recognition. And this is based on votes of WashingtonPost.com. These nominees had the greatest influence in shaping the past decade. Also, there is Time 100. Uh, Time 100 is the most important people of the century. Time has profiled uh, those individuals who, for better or worse, most influence the last hundred years. Now, Time's article cites 20 persons in each of five broad categories, leaders and revolutionaries, scientists and thinkers, builders and titans, or a tight, you know, what I'm, titans, artists, and entertainers, and heroes and icons. Now, like Lenin at the fin Finland station, 
after 17 years of exile in Europe, communist revolution Vladimir Lenin staged a triumph return to his home country on April 16, 1917, with an aim to seize power from the Russian government. His return journey would change the course of the world history in ways that are still being reckoned with today. Others, by refusing to depart, like Rosa Parks from her seat on the bus, or that kid from the path of the tank near Tiananmen Square, then there are folks who could have made freedom radiate through the walls of a Birmingham jail like Martin Luther King Jr. or through the walls from a South African prison like Mel Nelson Mandela. Others made machines that could fly and machines that could think and discovered a mold that could conquer infections. Then there are people like President Franklin D. Roosevelt who could inspire us with the phrase, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And then you have President John Kennedy, who inspired us with the phrase, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what can you do for your country. Let me say that again. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what can you do for your country? Also, we have Forbes' most powerful people. Uh, this is a business magazine. Forbes had compiled an annual list of the world's most powerful people. These are heads of state, financiers, philanthropists, and entrepreneurs. Now, there are nearly 7.5 billion humans on planet Earth. But these 75 men and women truly run the world or make the world turn. Now, you know what? The list has one slot for every 1 million people. 100 million people, I'm sorry, 100 million people. And slots are allocated based on the amount of human and financial resources that they have sway over as well as their influence on world events and whose action means the most. And then you have the most influential person in the history of the world. And today, I want to talk about that person. He's my hero. Now, what do I mean by hero? A hero is a real person or a main fictional character who, in the face of danger, combats adversity through feats of ingenuity or courage or, or strength. It is someone who gives of him or herself, often putting their life at great risk for the greater good of others. Or it can be someone who gave up his or her life so another could live. Hmm. Now, when I think about what today represents, I think about a man whose life story significantly influenced the course of human history and has directly or indirectly affected the lives of billions of people, even non-Christians. He is the most influential person who's ever lived. Let me say it again. He is the most influential person who has ever lived. And the way he presented himself to the world is absolutely mind-boggling. My opening text of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says this that though he was rich, yet for the sake, for your sake, he became poor, so that you through his poverty may become rich. Let me say it again. That though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that 
you through his poverty might become rich. In other words, he left the radiant splendors of heaven to come to earth. This humble planet infected by sin. In heaven, he shared the glory of his father. But on earth, he disguised his brilliant light and, appear and appeared as an ordinary baby boy. In heaven, he ruled from the throne of the universe. But here on earth, he was born in a barn or some consider it was a cave. In heaven, he was worshipped by millions of angels. Here, he was honored only by a handful of humble sheep herders and a few foreign star gazers and a small number of elderly saints in Jerusalem. In heaven, the wealth and grandeur of all creation was his. Here, he did not grow up in one of the great cities of the ancient world, like Rome or even Jerusalem, but he lived in, in a Galilean village called Nazareth. He had poor parents who, when they went to God's temple, they could not even afford to give the usual offering. But only the lesser one provided for indignant people. He was just a carpenter's son who later became a carpenter himself. He earned his living and supported his family by the sweat of his bra. He was he probably seemed poor to those who knew him, though there were many such folks then. No, he did not live in a grinding poverty, never knowing where his next meal would come from. But doubtless, there were times he didn't have a place to lay his own head. By today's standards, he was neither an upper class nor a middle class, but he was probably considered a peasant. And he lived in a hick town, in a backwater area of a second class land where a minor league people lived. At least that's how the sophisticated people of that day would esteem it. He was exposed to much meanness and outward poverty. He was born of poor parents and had no liberal education. He was brought up to have a trade. He was ministered to by others of their own substance. And he had nothing to even leave his mother at his death. But he commits her to the care of one of his very own disciples, all which fulfilled the prophecies of him that he should be. And then I want you to think about it. He died an appalling, humiliating death by crucifixion, reserved by the Romans for the most contemptible criminals, which he was not. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 23, verses 40 through 41, it says this, but the other criminals rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he says, since you are under the same sentence? Verse 41, when we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. He has done nothing wrong. I want y'all to think about this. For such an earthly background, how could he become so significant in world history? How could this be? But it is remarkable of his significance to world history. 
Few people would deny that this man was a real character of history. The impact he had and continues to have on mankind is unsurpassed by anybody. The whole world, the whole Western dating system pays witness to his historical reality so that the majority of people who live on earth known of him. They know him. They know of him. But who was this man? Who was this man? And what was the significance of his life and death? Was he just a great religious teacher or was there something more to his existence that we should know about? If we truly, really, if we truly really want to understand who this man is, we must turn to the pages of this Bible and examine its teaching in details so that we can be sure of the truth on the matter of what he is all about. Jesus said this in John 8.32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. One more time. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The person that I'm talking about today is not just my hero, but I also know him as my personal savior and Lord, who paid a debt that he did not owe. Hallelujah. And I owed a debt that I could not pay. And I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, all day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Now today I want to give you several points, maybe four points, to, to describe why this man is considered to be the greatest, not considered, he is the greatest person who ever lived. Point one, the word of God describes him as God made man in the flesh. I know this is an online service, but would you say that with me? The word of God describes him as God made man in the flesh. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 verifies this. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then also in John chapter 1, verse 14, it, it brings more clarity. It says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. And then in that same chapter of John, John the Baptist tells us who he is. He says this in John 129. Hallelujah. And this is referring to Jesus. He says this, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Let me say that again. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Billy Graham once shared the story of walking along a road and stepping on an ant hill. As he looked down, he saw the ants rolling over, scattering here and there. Some were dead from the weight of his frame. He thought to himself, if only, if only I could become an ant for just a moment. I could help them. He then went on to explain that this is how it is with God who became man in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why today all over the world, in spite of what's going on with 
COVID-19. This is still a day to celebrate the greatest day in the history of the world. Let me say, this is the greatest day in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, to some, especially to me and billions of others, he is the greatest hero of all time. But to others, opinions range widely about who he is as well as what he means in today's world. But few can disagree that he forever changed the course of history and civilization. Now, let me ask this question because you may be thinking this in your mind also. What qualifies Jesus to be the greatest person who ever lived? Let me say it again. What qualifies Jesus to be the greatest person who ever lived? Few people would deny that the man known as Jesus Christ was a real character of history. Not only is he in the Bible, but he is a part of history. The impact has had the impact he has had and continues to have on mankind is unsurpassed. As I said earlier, the whole Western dating system pays witness to his historical reality so that the majority of people who live on earth know of Jesus Christ. But the question still remains, who was this man? And what was the significance of his life and death? Was he some just great religious teacher or was there something more to the, his existence that we should know about? Let's talk about this. Number two, let's talk about his mission. His mission on earth was about people, all people. Let me say it again. His mission on earth was about people, all people. Black people, white people, Mexican people, Puerto Rican people, Japanese people, Russian people, uh, Middle Eastern people, uh, uh, rich people, uh, poor people, you name it. His mission on earth was about people. Not just some people, but all people. Who is Jesus Christ? And what is his mission to the world is certainly a logical question to ask. He changed the world in only 33 years of being on this earth. He changed the world. And no one has had more of an impact on this planet than Jesus Christ. This is, after all, his planet. He created it. In the in the first century A.D., huge throngs of listeners followed him in every city in all of his powerful miracles that he performed and the words he spoke. Demons were even cast out. People were raised from the dead. <laughs> Food was multiplied. He took two fish and five loaves of bread and he fed over 5,000 people. That didn't even include the women and children. People were healed of all types of diseases. Myths were shattered. Lives were changed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this about our Savior in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is talking about Jesus, and he's quoting this. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. And then Acts 
chapter 10, verse 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. That's some exciting stuff. You see, through the centuries, thousands of books, stories, television documentaries, films, and even novels have been written and produced about him. Hundreds of thousands of churches have been erected in his name. Millions have been called to be ministers, and billions have professed him as Lord and Savior. But yet, there's still another side to the coin. A question that still applies to today. There are people who are overwhelmed by what they have heard and seen from Jesus. And they wonder, who is this man called Jesus? This was not simply a matter of interest for the residents of Jerusalem. This is the question that is still being asked and answered today. Who is Jesus? And why should we pay attention to his teaching? Who is Jesus? And why have so many people put their lives under his authority? Some people are still contemporaries of Jesus. In the 21st century, there are an increasing number of people who are disinterested in religion. They don't want to have anything to do with religion in any form. And there are a lot of people that can care less about church, going to church, or uh, they, they just don't want to have any part of any church. There are still people in every city and town around the world who says, who is this? Who is this Jesus, and why should I listen to him? Now, in a world full of many religions and philosophies where people either believe all religions are the same or that some vague spirituality is all they need or want, it is important for us to have an answer to the question, who is this Jesus? You see, the world is full of books, as I said earlier. But let me say it this way. The world is full of books that have a shelf life of a few months to a few years, after which nobody reads it anymore. But then <laughs> there's the story of Jesus as found in the New Testament. This book has been handed down excuse me, from many generations to generations and from one language to another for nearly 2,000 years. Kingdoms have risen and fallen. Ideologies and philosophies have come and gone out of fashion. But during all that time and in spite of all the other voices and views, people are still lifting up the name of Jesus. Who is this? Who is able to remain relevant in his teaching and receive reverence from those who hear his voice? Many people are living lives today that could have not have imagined when they were younger. Maybe you were born into limited means and in poverty circumstances like I was. Maybe you were born in a place where people thought that you would never emerge like I was. And if you did emerge, they were sure you would not amount to anything like a lot of people thought about me. But then you met Jesus. And he began to open doors in your life. And you found yourself going places and receiving blessings that you might not 
have ever imagined otherwise? You know, I think about that song that said, how I got over. <laughs> oh, how I got over. My soul looks back and wonder how I got over. Who is this who could take men such as Peter, James, and John and turn those fishermen from Capernaum into household names in every corner of the earth? Who is this that could take a Pharisee named Saul an opponent to Christianity. And in a single encounter on the Damascus Road, turn him into the chief proponent of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very man whose name he once had attempted to abolish. Now he had become a follower of Christ. Who is this who can take people who passed through the dark night of sorrow and suffering and transformed them into surgeons and, and teachers and, and musicians and scientists and preachers and scholars and statesmen. Who is this who can take the sons and daughters of poverty and limited means and bring them into lives of promise and prosperity and potential? Who is this who can look upon injustice all over the world and infuse the people living under oppression and injustice with the belief that things can be better? Then equip those to go about doing the work that will make their world a better place. Who is this? Only a sovereign God can do something like that. He is the architect of the world of creation. He is the victor over sin, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. He is the second person of the Godhood, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who is this? He is the wonderful counselor and the mighty God of the book of Isaiah. <laughs> He is the one about whom John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. He is the one whose birthplace in Bethlehem was foretold by Micah. He is the one after whom an entire floral shop could be named by. After all, he is the Rose of Sharon. He is the Lily of the Valley. He is the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He is the Lamb of God whose blood has washed my sins away. He is the pearl without price that placed an even greater value on our lives. Boy, this is, this is something. Come on now. Come on now. Somebody say something. Somebody say something online. I know I can't hear you, but say something. But he is the man that loved. He is the man they loved on Palm Sunday condemned, killed, and buried on Good Friday. But oh, thank God, he got up on Resurrection Sunday with all power in his hands. You know, the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 9 says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death has, death no longer has dominion over him. Let me say it again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Who is this? Marvin A. McMurkles, president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divine Divinity School, said this about him. Caesar's dead and forgotten, but Jesus still sits on the throne. The high priest Caiaphas, who schemed to have him killed, is a minor footnote in history. But Jesus remains the central figure in the world today. Pontius Pilate washed his hands with water, but Jesus washed my soul clean with his precious blood. Judas got 30 pieces of silver and then committed suicide. But Jesus, who was crucified and buried, now sits at the right hand of God in heaven. Who is this? Who is this man? 
let's conclude that Jesus is the one about whom the triumph hymn was written. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the riled diadem and crown him Lord of all. That's who he is. He is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of the past. He is the Lord of the present. And he is the Lord of the future. He is the Lord of the living and the dead. He is the Lord from the guttermost to the uttermost. He is Lord of all. The next time someone asks you, who is this? Whether he or she speaks with contempt or amazing, this is what you can tell them. Who is Jesus? Now, I don't want to be disrespectful of other religions, but I do want to say this because this is true. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is who Jesus is. <laughs> he loved the worst of sinners. He loved the best of saints. He loved lepers and prostitutes, young children, older people, religious people, atheists. Jesus Christ showed the love of God in human flesh. Point number three. To tell you why he's the greatest person that ever lived. Number three. Jesus' mission. What was it? Jesus' fundamental mission on earth was to fulfill God's plan. It was to fulfill God's plan. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says this. To seek and to save the loss. To seek and to save the loss. He was aware of his purpose, even from a young age, and intentionally set about to fulfill it. Christ knew that God's plan for him was to die on the cross as an atonement for the sins of those who put their faith in him and to rise again from the dead in victory over sin and death. So toward the end of his life, Jesus deliberately made his way to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to face a cross, knowing that he was going to be whipped, knowing that he was going to be beaten, knowing that he was going to be mocked, knowing that he was going to die. John 10, 18 says, no one takes it from me. But I lay down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. He gave his life freely. He gave it freely. And then number four, Christ came to save the sinners. To eat with them talk with them, and to show them God's love. In fact, he was often criticized for spending too much time with sinners. Those, the self-righteous religious leaders of that day had cast him away. Jesus not only spent time with such people, he sought them out because his mission was to save those who needed saving. During Jesus' ministry, he intentionally made a point of showing these outcasts 
forgiveness and offering them a new life. Luke 5.32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want to close with S.M. Lockridge, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego. And it's entitled, That's My King. Do you know him? <laughs> Let me say it again. That's my king. Do you know him? The Bible says my king is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. <laughs> He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. Let me say it again. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measures can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreline supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, grateful. He's impurely powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomena that ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. <laughs> He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in solitude of himself. He's awesome. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be all sufficient Savior. Hallelujah. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. Boy, hallelujah, hallelujah. He cleans lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He, re he rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. Well, my king is the king. He is the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring to wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He is the roadway of righteousness. He is the highway of holiness. He is the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Let me say it again. Do you know him? Well, 
His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. <laughs> Hallelujah. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. Hallelujah. His grace is sufficient. He reigns in righteousness. Hallelujah. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Wow. I wish I could describe him to you. But he's indescribable. Let me say it again. He's indescribable. Well, he's in comprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't live or you can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him. But they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Hallelujah. Let me say it again. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave could not hold him. Yea, that's my king. That's my king. Father, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And when you get through with all the forevers, then amen. And amen. I want to begin to wrap this up with Romans 8.34. Christ who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The greatest person who ever lived is Jesus Christ and he lives now. He lives now. He lives now. He lives now. And he's ready to meet you at the very point of of your need he's ready to do things that you cannot do or that are in, uh, humanly possible to do God is a God of love and he cares for you and he don't want you to perish he don't want you to die in your sins and he wants you to lift your eyes up toward the hills from whence your help coming from he wants to be your Lord and he wants to be your Savior and I'm here to say today that if you don't know him as your personal Savior and Lord, you can come to know him as Savior and Lord. I just want you to pray this prayer with me. But before you pray this prayer, it says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's pray that prayer. Would you repeat with me? Lord, I recognize today that you are the greatest person who ever lived. And when you came to earth in humanly form, you came with me in mind. I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me of all of my sins. You would forgive me, Lord. And you would wash my sins away. And you would throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. I believe that you, Jesus, was the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again to conquer death so that I can have eternal life, that when I leave this earth one day, I will live with you in heaven. I accept that by faith in Jesus' name. And I want to remind those that are Christians, don't ever forget where God has brought you from. Don't ever forget what he's done in your life. Don't ever forget that. He loves you. He cares for you. And he wanted to continue to meet you at the very point of your need. 
and he wants you. I want to encourage you during this pandemic. I want to encourage you to stay in the word. I want to encourage you to, to watch online services. I want you. To, I want to encourage you to spend time in prayer. I want to encourage you to, to share your faith with other people. God bless you. I want you to know, as our motto says, you matter to God and you matter to us. Now on the screen, you're going to see a message come up that you can send us your prayers or you can say that I made a commitment to the Lord and I want you to go to that website. It is the, T-H-E, house, H-O-U-S-E, of O-F, peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, the number four, the letter U, at gmail.com. And email us and say, I gave my life to Christ, here's my information. Or if you have already given your life to Christ and you are saved, send us your prayer request so that we can pray over your prayer request because prayer is a very powerful thing. Thank you. God bless you.